but it's from people who have really done it. Not people who just read about it or talked about it or thought about it, but people who have been in there. Podcast, Thank you very time. much. Yeah. And now you are an author? Yes. Is this your first book? It's, it is the first first book, uh, first uh, full book, I suppose. I've done many reports okay. and surveys. And so things, you like, you like to write? No. You <laughs> You're not a big writer. I, uh, what I like to do is okay. exactly what we're doing now. I like talking to people. Oh, do you? So I like interviewing people. Right. And that's a lot of it is. So first, let me let me give you the book. Yes. This is your, this is your copy. And yes. thanks very much for all the Story from the Gimba. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Your first book. And this is about, I, I mean, I, I read some of the um, write-ups on it that you had on your site. Right. And it's basically about foreigners here that have done unique things. Yeah. And you have, they're basically executives or the CEOs of their company, yeah. right? Yeah. How many people total did you do? Well, it is, first to explain sort of the, the, the maybe the context and, and answer your, the question you asked me earlier mm -hmm. on. So what I like doing is talking to people. So when I thought about doing a book, I said this book has got to be about talking to people. Mm -hmm. It's got to be about stories from people who really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so the people, we talked to many, many people and probably around around 20 or so in a, in a sort of structured way um, and then 13 of them we've taken the transcripts and and um, and have them in the in the book itself mm -hmm. so the book is all about I mean the first word in the title is stories they're stories um, and I think storytelling is just you know it's just a more interesting way right. of getting a message across mm -hmm. isn't it um, so they're stories and they're from the Gemba, you know, like we know what the Gemba is, but the book explains what the Gemba is to people mm -hmm. who are not familiar with the, with the word. But it's from people who have really done it, not people who just read about it or talked about it or thought about it, but people who have been in there um, and done it. Mm -hmm. And then the subtitle gets to that these are people who've done it for a long time. Mm -hmm. They've done it on the ground. They've done it for a long time in Japan, so they know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you know what it's like. I mean, if you want to find out about anything, the best place to go is not to people who have strong opinions about things, but people who have actually done it. That's and right, so that's, right. that's that's what the book is about. So what made you decide to do a book like this? Well, I mean... You, you did this with your partner, David. David yes. So Dave, David, David is a better writer than I am. Um, so when I thought about doing the book, I thought, you know, I can't... I, 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 I can, I'm, I'm good at editing, I think. Right. And I'm good at sort of structuring a, a story and, 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 and that side of it. But to actually write it. David is much better and I've known David as a friend for so this 30 years. So this book's idea was originally your idea? Yeah. yeah. But see, so you said, okay, I need some people that are better in certain areas than I am. Yeah. So David I gave David a shout for, yeah, so I've known him for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we worked together on, on writing it. Um, but yeah, I couldn't have, it wouldn't be a book without, without David. Okay. Um, why did you, why so did why you did I do it? Yeah. So we're sitting around at the start of COVID and you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, there were some podcasts and some YouTube channels and, um, and Clubhouse wasn't a thing really. What people didn't even really understand what Clubhouse was before, before COVID. But all of a sudden they started to increase because, you know, we couldn't travel anymore. So through all of these different shows and platforms and everything, I started to meet people that see, come across people that I've been here for 30 years. A lot of them are actually in Tokyo, and I still hadn't met them, maybe because they were in a different industry or just I wouldn't come across them. Some of them were geographically, you know, down in Kansai or Kyushu or, or, or Okinawa or wherever. And so I started seeing these amazing people and learning a lot, you know, and including your, your, your channel. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first thing. I thought, wow, this is, there are a lot of interesting people there. You know, I think it's, it's, it's easy to, you know, dismiss people without meeting them, isn't it? But as soon as you hear people talking, and you know, I mean, the interest, amazing people you've had on, on, on your podcast and YouTube channel. Um, so again, yeah, once I heard that, I thought, wow, this is, this is great. So I got pretty engaged in that. And, you know, I, I, as you said, I was on, on, on your podcast before. And you told me, you said you, you were writing it then. Oh, we, were, we were just starting. You started, yeah, yes, right. you just starting. Like yeah, right. Yeah. So I think that was, the, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was, that, you know, when you hear people who really know what they're talking, um, what they're talking about, you know, a lot of what we do is trying to correct stereotypes or simplifications about Japan, sort of lazy observations about Japan by people who know a little bit and then latch in on that and then, you know, and then they describe 
the Japanese as being like this, or Japanese companies they as being book like this. So they write a whole book about it. Make a fortune. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe that's yeah. Maybe I should have. So that was the that was the thing. I thought, well, yeah, you know, I've got to, I've got, I've got to really, um, you know, capture these stories. I suppose I've got to talk to these people, and you know, here's what a resource here. Um, so so that was that was the uh, that was the, the the second thing, and then as we talked about earlier on, the the idea of talking to them directly, interviewing them, and and gathering their stories and collating them into something. And, you know, we looked around and there wasn't there wasn't anything there really. No one had done this. Right. Um, so we thought oh, it's an interesting format and it, uh, it it's it's engaging and so why not? So we set off to do the book. Fifteen people you said about you having your book, right? Yeah. You plan on doing a second and a third and a fourth? Um, I You've think got a lot know, of people here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think you know maybe what we've done is come up with a little bit of a template that you know that other people could do as well and do it in different formats. Um, well, I'm uh, doing it in um, this format. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but had you had you thought about ever doing something like this before? You did this book. No, no. I mean, you know, I suppose anybody, any of us who've been here for a long time, we all think, you know, like you're, you've been doing this work for a long time, and what you're doing is is collecting stories, collecting right, people's right. stories, and um, and I suppose we all have it in the back of our minds. But I, I, I didn't really think about a book. I don't think, and I thought I probably saw myself as more someone who would be interviewed by someone else for right. a book oh, rather than the person who did the book. Oh, themselves. that's right. Yeah. I think that's what happens for most of, most of yeah. us. We're not living in our own country. Yeah. We're living away, and we said, someone's going to ask me about Japan, I'll be able to tell yeah, yeah. my experience. Yeah, yeah. That's, so you, yeah. you did you get enjoyment out of this? Did you meet oh, these people, did you meet them directly, or did you? Was um, it, done over it was a mixture. The earlier interviews were all on Zoom. All of them? Yeah. Uh, the, the earlier interviews, the earlier I can't, interview. yeah. Um, so so it might have been 50-50 or so, like towards okay. the end, and, and for some second interviews, follow-up interviews as well that we did. You know, it, it, as the deeper we got into COVID, the more we were able to go out, I suppose. Right. Um, and particularly some of the people were, two or three, were from down my area, down in Kamakura, right, right, right. Fujisawa area. Um, so we were, able so. To, we were able to meet locally. Yeah. So when you were interviewing the people, did you find any similarities from how they felt about what was going on here? That you felt it was a common thread to almost everyone? I th yes. Common threads, but different ways of looking at it. So, right, okay. so they're sort of... You know, when you read the book, you'll see there are different stories looking at the same issue from from uh, different perspectives. So we, we so we did these interviews, okay. and the style of interviews was very similar to yours. Um, and I and, and I learned that from from your interview. Was that right? Because what you do, um, and it's not what everybody does, is you go with the flow. What I learned from you was uh, one was. The thing that what's important here is what the interviewee has to say. Not not it's not about the interviewer. And the other thing was just what you said. No, I didn't go as deeply into talking to them about their you know early years and and everything. But I did talk to them. And each uh, interview chapter is structured as there is a, a a profile, and then there's a paragraph, a short paragraph by me saying this is how I know this person. This is why I wanted to talk to them, and and this is what I. I talk to them about uh, just a short little paragraph mm -hmm. to give that context because I totally agree. Now, with was you that your was that your idea? Or was that David's? It was yours. It was well. It was because mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly remember. You know, there are other interviews that you go into, uh, and it's not everyone because there are people that's, that's as good as you out there as well. There's other people. people I always think people. everyone's better than me. <laughs> no, but I was very conscious of that when you interviewed me last time. That we spent the first twenty minutes talking about my childhood in Cork. You know? <laughs> and that's very unusual. You know, people make make sure you go back to the earlier podcast so you can find out about <laughs> Frank. Because that's why the second interview, whenever I have someone on the second time, they can talk about whatever they want. Then you have to go back to the first one to find out who's telling you this. Right. You'll know the core. Right. Go on. Yeah. So, so we deliberately, we talked about this. We deliberately structured the chapters like that. There's actually a little quote up on top to try and pull out the core of what they were trying to say. And you know you do that, and other people do that on their channels as well, where you have a little, you know, a ten second soundbite or something that just gives sort of, a, you know, this is the the essence of what this person was. So we tried to pull out the essence on top as a photograph, so people know what they look like. 
um, and then there is a brief profile to see to show their connection with Japan, how they got here, what they've been doing, what they're doing now, um, and then there is the context of why I talked to them. Absolutely, <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> that's neat. Uh, this was this was your plan from the beginning. Well, we wanted to give a face to the and a little bit of context mm -hmm. to the person, and not just talk about what they think, but to give a little bit of context. So, so well. we can get involved with them, mostly involved with them. Yeah. Right? I think good movies are that way too. Mm -hmm. They get you involved with the character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you feel some empathy, or you yeah. feel some commonness with yeah. this person. Then you can follow them through on their yeah. journey. I'm a big soccer fan. I, oh, okay. I watch the the Premier League, the English Premier League. And you know, games are so much interesting if they give you a little bit of information. You know, like, who's that guy? You know, there's a there's one player famously um, came back from uh, a very serious um, battle with cancer, and he was out for three years, and he just came back this season, okay. and he scored a goal. I think he scored a goal on. I think it was the first game he was back. He certainly scored a goal. But it might have been the first game when he came back. Okay. It was a player for uh, Newcastle United defender, and he uh, he was. Born in Newcastle and could never break into. He was a huge fan. Could never break into the Premier League. Played in the lower leagues. Finally got into the team last year. They have to. They have to. He's his late twenties. No, no. no they're, well, they're 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 scouted. You know, okay, scouted. They got scouts going around the the, okay, the, okay. the more minor leagues. Um, and at I don't know, he's like twenty eight or twenty nine or something. And he's finally got into the first. Mm -hmm. And like when he scored, you know, the local fans. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally agree with you. Just a little bit of information about characters, then all of a sudden something is really interesting. So that's what we were trying to do. Uh, did you books. have any favorites? Uh, they're all great. <laughs> they're all. They're all that. You better say that. You can't say you. <laughs> they're, they're they're all they're all that's great. Right. But there were well, you there were some pictures in here too. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know we so. just wanted to give that sort of context. Um, there, there are no favorites, and all of the stories are interesting. There were, um, there were some surprises um, with, with you know, particular people. Uh, I'd say maybe 50-50 people I knew before, and people I knew I then got to know for the first time through the book or through social media. Um, there is a, uh, you, you may know him, a Canadian lawyer, um, Harold Gotso. You know Harold. No. I mean, Harold is an absolutely amazing person. He is he's a lawyer, and he also has degrees in computer science and philosophy. And I mean, you get him talking about Japan, and you know you you know it's going to be interesting. So I mean, mm -hmm. I, that's that that one is is a must read. And and it's just because of his mixed background, and he's been in Japan for you know as long as we have. He's fluent in Japanese, um, and uh, just the way he tells stories, the context he creates for stories is is amazing. He should have his own. So we get them on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, see, absolutely. You know what, Luke, see, I, I, I have to tell you right now, just so you won't be surprised. As soon as I read your starts on there, I talked to my one of my assistants, one of the people that helps write all the descriptions. Mm -hmm. And I said, Frank's doing exactly what I'm doing. What did we just do? <laughs> but he's doing but I said, but, but I said, but he's doing it better. <laughs> he's doing it better. He sat back and he's making it even better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call everybody in here <laughs> and get them on my podcast. Oh, they, they, they'd all be fascinating. I want to get them all in here. Yeah. When are you going to make this an audio book? No, that's, that's going to be. got to do it because that's the way I take yeah. my books in. Right, right. Audio. Right. And it's so easy nowadays. Yeah. You've got to make this an audio book. Well, I could ask people to, I can read the first part of it. And, and David has actually got much, much nicer reading voice than I have, he might do it. Um, but yeah, we could ask the contributors to read their own chapters. That's Because I think that's a big growing market. Right, right. Because so, much of, so many of us want to try to do so many things. And, yeah. and in the background, we're doing something that's automatic. Yeah. Yeah. We want to listen to something. Yeah. Most of the podcasts I listen to, I'm listening to while I'm walking. Isn't that interesting? Or, or commuting. Or, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Something that you know isn't going to take away from what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So the same here. Whenever I'm walking early in the morning, I walk yeah. for about an hour. Right. I want to hear something. Yeah. But yeah. but now they have the the earpods that don't go in your ears. They go here. Oh yeah. I've so you can still it, hear, yeah. but you can hear someone coming behind right, you right, too, or right. a car coming yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Okay. So what was the next thing on this? So, so I, I, I just to, 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 to um, think it is just I suppose the structure of the book. So we talk about why why we wrote it and how we the methodology behind it. But so the structure was we wanted it to be mostly about the stories. So two thirds of the book is interviews, which we've We've edited to a degree just to, to, to have a flow, but it's it is the voice of the of the person you interviewed. So the first part of the book is an overview, 
um, and maybe looking at sort of you know why trying to create a context of why you should listen to these people you know why are they sh their stories important um, so that's about a third of the book the first part one is that is overview and then part two is uh, the interviews the transcripts and that's you know it's formatted as an interview I'm asking them questions and, mm -hmm. um, so that's it's structured like that and it's means, two parts in, in, in your in your editing process what were you t what, what kind of things were you taking out you, know, you spoke to them. What I found interesting was, um, you know, when you're speaking, you know, there's so many cues that, you know, you're, you're looking at the person's face, you're looking at their body language, the, the cadence, the, you know, there are all sorts of things, there are all sorts of messages coming in, quite apart from what they're actually saying. Um, and, and, and that means that you can't just take what they said and put it down on a page and you know, with some people you can, and some parts of everybody's interview you can, mm -hmm. but you need to actually edit it. And that's actually something I became better at um, as, as we went through, and then we went back to the earlier ones and had to re-edit them, some of them. But um, it's something I learned over the process is how to listen, try and maintain their original voice as much as possible, but also reorganize it a little bit so it makes more sense in, in, in the written word. OK, well, excuse me, I'm just, let me just, Digest that a little bit, because I remember some issues I had with um, my things being edited when I was over the club here yeah. through our communications yeah. place. I wanted people to hear how I sounded, yeah. so I told them don't ever change. Yes, yeah. because <laughs> I was the president of the club, yeah. and people know how I speak. Yeah. They know how I get excited. Yeah. And I'm not mad, I just get excited about different things. I'm passionate. Yeah. That's what I would do. So I wrote, I write that one. Mm. And they were changing it all the time because right. they felt, it, it, you reminded me a little bit about that when mm -hmm. you said you had to make the flow this and that. Mm -hmm. just, how do you mean it? Do you put in words that you think no, that they wanted? No, and, and on some of this was because, and I know is the answer to that, it is okay. where keeping it's, their it's voice was really important. Okay. So I think maybe there are two things. One is um, is because of the style of the interviewing. You know, I didn't want to interrupt what they were saying. So even if I thought, oh wow, they've just jumped over to another topic here, or they've actually contradicted themselves here, um, because you do that in conversation. You know, I just let it go in the, and sure. so I ended up with maybe you know an hour and a half, two hours of of, of audio. Mm -hmm. um, and then so then we had to just reorganize it a little bit in parts and some people are just so organized you know i'd say there are maybe three um, people and these people are rare i mean they're and it's, it's, it's a gift that, that you know you hardly need to do anything here um but you know usually there's just we're all human and, and usually there's something that, that needs to be done so, so part of it was because of that um then the other thing was that we made it clear with everyone that before we published, we would give the transcript back exactly to them and, and they'd have a chance that was gonna, that to was look through it. Yeah. Now, on occasion, people said, um, said, ah, oh, actually what I meant was, and they, so they rewrote it they themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, some other things, you know, a merger and acquisition happened that wasn't there before or something. And, uh, you know, one that jumps to mind is uh, Jeff Bozier, who, who works in, in the Hollywood business. Um, and he was talking about HBO Max. You now, you've probably heard in the last week or so that they've rebranded from HBO Max to Max. <laughs> I mean, they've taken the branded bit, <laughs> they've thrown that away, and they've, and, they, and they've kept the generic bit. I just totally don't get it. But, but anyway, but, uh, it, so Jeff sort of knew that by the time, when he got this transcript, he knew that by the time the book came out, that it would be called Max. So that's just a small example. Mm. So there was a little bit of that as well. But uh, no, the, the, the point, though, is that, uh, yes, just keep the voice of the person. Yeah. And, and, and the biggest and, thing you already said, Frank, is that you allowed everyone to see it yeah. before it yeah. went out. Yeah. And many people don't. Uh, so. As the author of something, as the owner of something, you, know, you should have a chance to see it before it goes to print. Or and goes that's public. one reason why, like some people, let other people edit this. I said, I cannot let anyone edit what I do. Right. And the other thing is, you know, being in Japan, where long-term relationships are really, really important. You know, we don't want to make anyone unnecessarily, sometimes make people angry. <laughs> so what we were trying to do was to go from, you know, the stereotypical questions that people have. So look at those and then say, well, you know, where does that come from? Because there's a, there's a kernel of truth in, in everything. You know, there's a reason people are saying that. So what's the big picture thing or what's the big idea that that's coming from? And actually, what does it mean? You know, what's the new question that they should be asking? So it's, 
So it's about the, the first part, is, but the, the guts of it is about trying to ask the right questions and trying to train people to ask the right questions. And that's just something you come across all the time, isn't it? Right, it is so. People asking the wrong question. And then try and relate that to some examples from the stories that come back in part two. So we're in part one, we're constantly referring to, you know, so in part two, you know, this person talks about, gives a story along these lines about this particular topic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, just simple examples of the types of, um, of, of uh, stereotypes is, you know, people talk about particularly, you know, a new expat in the country that have been told, you know, Japanese are, are group oriented. And it's all about consensus thinking and, you know, then it's implied that there's some sort of lack of individuality and that they're manipulated, they're easily manipulated and all this sort of thing. And, and of course we all know that that's not true. You know, the reality that we find is, you know, the, the, the most individual person I know is my wife and my daughter. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's just not, not, not true at all. But where that comes from, and for example, you know, I mentioned Harold earlier on. Harold and other people talk about this as well. Um, is you know, it's, it really, that, that sort of thing really gets back to the social contract in Japan. And, and the social contract in Japan is, is about giving up, um, giving up, you know, accepting discipline, I suppose, not giving up, but accepting discipline in return for security. And the reasons why that happens, you know, we're living in a country with natural disasters at any time. We could have an earthquake right now. The risk that all of their century, that's, yeah. yes. Yeah, and you need people to pull together to, and you know, do. to deal with these, and they do. Um, one a friend of mine, Alan, Alan Fulford, and but other people um, tell tell the same story, you know, about the rice culture here, and the, you know, with the, you know, you had a short season, with a very labor intensive task, um, and you got to get this rice in, otherwise people could starve in the winter. So in order to do that, you need everyone to pull their weight. So you need rules around everything that happens. You know. At this time we'll do this. At this time we'll do this. You will do this. Your family will do this. You know, and you have to have that buy-in. So it's not about people being group-oriented or mindless or whatever. That's what it's necessary. actually that's what's necessary, and it's very. And then it becomes a very rational decision by an individual to say, okay, do I want to obey the rules and be part of all of this and have rights to eat during the the, the winter, or am I going to be a maverick and uh, <laughs> and buck the system and be kicked out? Um, it's done. Yeah. So, you know, so it's no surprise then, I mean, because if you, you know, if you don't obey the rules, you'll be kicked out and you'll, you'll starve in a, in a, in a very simple sense. Mm. I had a, a personal example of this in my, none of my neighbors are ever watched this. So, um, so you know, the Chonaikai that you have, the community group um, that you have where you live. Um, there was an incident in, so I live in a, 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 a development area of about 200 houses in our area. And um, the Chonai guy is very protective of the of the environment, and we all obey the rules. We we obey, the, and it's not the government doesn't decide a lot of these things. Of how many meters there must be between houses? What color you paint your house? How many floors you build? Um, now there was a time two or three years ago when uh, an outsider came in, and he was going to build an Airbnb. He thought. Now, there are no zoning laws stopping him from okay. building the Airbnb, but what happened was that he was immediately defined as being sort of outside of our group, so it was all bets are off. He disobeyed the rules, they shunned him, and there was quite a vocal and you know, explicit campaign, you know, like posters stuck all over the wall outside his house, you know, go away, get out and everything, and he had no option but to, but to leave. And that's, so that's the way things happen. So there are real rational reasons why people decide to obey the rules and, and you know, accept the discipline in return for security and in return for not being, not being kicked out. So it's, it's that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other one you hear a lot um, in business is, uh, you know, Japanese, they, they don't engage. Japanese employees, you know, they don't engage with the with company. They, they score low on all these engagement studies, so therefore they're not engaged. And, and that, like, it doesn't make sense in a country where, you know, you have Kaizen, then you have, you know, people on the face of it are very loyal to their, to their companies. Um, so that, that sort of doesn't make sense for the beginning. So there's something wrong there, you know. And when you think, you know, it's not about why don't they engage. The question is, why are the scores so low? And when you ask the question that way, you realize that, well, and there's a, there are a lot of studies around this, you know, that the engagement studies that everybody uses 
are designed for a completely different culture. They're designed for people who are love to stand up and you know, the promote themselves. And, yes, yeah. exactly. and that's not going to happen in Japan. And actually, when you do it in a different way, and several contributors have stories of this, you know, when you realize that and how the dynamics work in the company, and you set things up in a different way, you know, over time, you, you'll get people as engaged as you will have in anything else. You know? And I, I've had that experience myself. I was going to well. say, that, that relates to how we used to be given the IQ test yeah. in America, and they give it into one area, let's mm. say it could be a Vietnamese area or right. a Hispanic area mm. or something. It's based upon the white IQ. Right. Right. And if you do based upon that, yeah. they've never experienced yeah. the same thing. So how are they going to get a high score on something they've never experienced? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wouldn't work. Yeah, no, like I quote Ross Robery. I, I talked to Ross Robery for the book as well. Who, who do you know Ross? Is no. Ross, he was formerly the, the head of Edelman Japan, you know, the Edelman, the biggest PR company in the world. He is now the uh, co-head of communications at Nomura. Okay. Um, so Ross is a you know, for Ross, he's from Australia, and it's my, but I think he's very well known in the in the business community in Japan. And, um, he he's definitely someone you should have a lot of talking here. I mean, Ross is you, you always want to listen to what Ross has to say about it. Um, but he said, you know, it's all about why. It's all it's it's all about understanding why. So when you see these, you know, people asking the wrong question, you know, they're not asking a question that gives you the answer of why is this. So that's observed behavior there. You know, yes, it is a fact that. You know, despite the tight labor market in Japan right now, Japanese people are still not job hopping. You know, you think they would, and foreign companies come in and they offer you know twenty percent above market rates for this particular um, thing, and they, they they won't go. And the the why answer is not about lifetime employment and loyalty to the company. Everything, it's actually again, it's it it quite quite probably is an individual calculation that over the course of my career, and this is what the, the data shows, I will be better off for monetary reasons and for you know, social security and all, you know, all of these uh, other things as well, um, staying with a, a steady job and going along, you know, rising steadily, rather than bump, 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 and you know, it, it's a calculation, it's an individual calculation. So it's all this asking, you know, why, not, not just what, and then describing it and ascribing it to a stereotype. It's really why, why, why. And that's what all of the people we interviewed were really, really good at. I was talking to one of the people I interviewed for the book who happens to be a very close friend as well. And he said, well, you know, you can just pick this book up on any one page and you could probably write another book about, you know, just that. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, so, so many things there. And I, I'd really, you know, not just selfishly, just objectively almost, you know, recommend the book to people, anyone who's interested in, in, in doing business in Japan. I suppose if there, if there's to pick three things, and you have to pick three, so that's what, you know, everyone has okay. three things. Um, one is just culture. It is the, the importance of being able to, you know, to operate, to navigate, and to make decisions and make the right calls in a in a cross cultural um, situation. Um, but there's a but after that, um, which we'll talk about in a second. The other is the. And this is, in a, in a sense, it's the, it's the thesis of the book, and it's the conclusion of the culture of it in a lot, in a lot, of, a lot of ways. It's, it's the, you know, I believe strongly that if I was a company uh, over in the US or any part of Europe, or um, um, you know, Asia might be a, a, a little bit different for historical reasons, but certainly people coming from, companies coming from, from Western cultures, I would first look at whether there's someone here on the ground that knows Japan, um, and we can train up in our in our brand, in our products, um, rather than the assumption that had been happening for many years. You know, we send someone over from, from head office. Now, there are some times when that's necessary, you know, where you, you're in a business that's got such a steep learning curve, you know, maybe the airline industry or the automotive industry or some kind of high tech thing that, you know, it just, there's a lot of knowledge transfer from head office, so you do need to structure differently. But for, for most businesses, understanding the country and the culture and how people work and knowing how to engage and motivate your people, how to work with Japanese partners um, and how to make money here, you know, that's going to be more valuable. So that's, that's the second thing is that if there's a choice between the expat and what we call Japan insider country managers, we'd fall on. And I think if you read this book, you will agree. Mm. The third one is what I call the, the holy trinity. When you look at the 
companies, and we're, we're looking at SMEs for the most part, you know, um, when you look at companies that hum, that work really well, they work really well because there's a really good relationship between the country manager in the middle, their boss back in head office, or maybe in the regional office in, in, in Asia, and the senior management team, and often the sort of second in command. Um, when that hums, it really hums. And that's, you know, and one, um, we've got quotes up front. One of the quotes we picked from one of the, one of the interviewees is that you know, the absolute best situation is where you've got that working really well. You've got trust, you've got understanding, you've got division of responsibilities, um, and you've got some overlap as well, and you've got you know, the, 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 the room to debate and challenge um, as well between those three people. Business is home, and I know that for myself, from my own experience. I mean, Thomas the Tank Engine is one. When I, that was an example in my career, where my my boss is still a great friend over in in London. Um, actually, talking to him at four o'clock today, even though I haven't worked with him for fifteen years, we're we're just good friends. Um, my Japanese colleague um, Goshi Nakano, and and Peter, you know, they're the three of us. We just all respected each other. We all trusted each other, and that was great fun. But when it breaks down, you know, it can be really, really bad. Um, and when it breaks down, the danger is for the, the real risk is for the country manager. Because there's sort of been a, a very unique um, uh, environment where, you know, one, one person referred to it as, as sort of the, the, uh, the, the re reverse proximity bias. You know, you're far away from everything. So you don't have the ear of the CEO. You don't have uh, an internal network. You know, HR probably doesn't even know who you are. Um, so when things go bad, you know, there's nowhere to go. In, in really extreme cases, mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go. So one of the strong messages that comes out of the book is that this really, you know, it's not in the company's interest. It's certainly not in the, in the Japan country manager's interest for things to fall apart. Things will go bad at some stage. There will be problems. And it's just absolutely essential that companies spend time thinking about having a process there, a fair process. You know, the outcome might be shake hands and move right. on. Mm -hmm. But ideally, it's not. It's you know, sure. most problems, any part of, your, of anyone's life, you know, most problems can be worked out by, by talking. You know? yeah. So that's, that's uh, something that came through you know, very, very strongly. Is there something that's neglected? Um, particularly from an HR point of view, is to just have a process for this particular structure that you end up with in, in international business. And it's not just Japan, really. It's international business mm -hmm. anywhere. If, they, if you've got a major market like Japan is, and it's a long way away from head office, both in distance and culturally, um, something is going to come up. And when sure. something comes up, you've got to have a system oh, yeah. there to take care of it. You know, one of the people who should have this book is like every country manager in Japan because not to learn, uh, they will learn stuff, but to throw the book at head office and say, because, you know, like it's not just, I'm, it's not just me saying this, here are all these other well, people saying it. They've been here, they have done it, they have been through the fire yeah. already. Yeah. Culture and, you know, understanding culture and being able to navigate culture in, in business and in life here as important. And, um, but the thing is, is that there, there are nuances and there are also things that seem like contradictions but actually aren't. And you, you need to understand that as well. You know, so yes, you know, you, on the top line, you know, people will talk about um, you know, how to communicate in the company. And you know, yes, that's a fairly straightforward skill that you're going to learn in, in some ways. And, um, and, and there are things like, you know, one, one uh, person from the ad agency was talking about uh, the difference in understanding or assumptions about how people are trained before they come to your company, what they learn at university, and what they might have learned at a Japanese company. He was thinking about marketing people in particular. And in his industry, you know, you learn disciplines in an MBA in, in the US. He was talking from the US and Canada point of view. Um, but in Japan, they don't. So if you're a foreign company here, and you're hiring from, you think it's this pool of people with these skills, you're actually hiring someone you know, with, without those skills. 
And when he joined one particular company at one stage, he realized that why the miscommunication was happening was because the assumptions about how people were trained and what they brought to the company and their own assumptions about what their jobs were, you know, were different. So, so there's, there's, there's all that sort of, all, all that sort of thing. And, and, you know, and there's great examples and, and advice on how to deal with those things. There are even more tricky ones. And like getting back to what you were saying there, um, you know, Japan generally is like that, you know, people all, praised the uh, uh, Japanese fans at the World Cup for tidying up after them. But what no one talks about overseas, but we all know here, is that actually that's only true when you can, when they're being watched. It, the behavior can be very, very different when they're not being observed, because what they're really doing is they want to be seen to be complying to the rules. Because if you're seen to be complying to the rules, you won't be kicked out, you won't be banished, you won't starve. You don't gain anything from obeying the rules when no one's watching. You know, no one's going to kick you out of the group because of something they didn't see. So, so that's why um, you know you get people throwing rubbish in the countryside. That's why you get. I live down in Kamakura, and people bury their rubbish in the sand and, and, and go back to Tokyo. A lot of the locals would do it, but they. So you get this behavior when people aren't watching. Um, that is not as good as the behavior that you know we all like to think Japanese. Right? So there's some nuances there. And if you're managing here, you know, you need to understand that. You need to understand that people respond to being seen to be doing the right thing rather than just doing the right thing. And you need to structure you know, the way you work and the, the, the way you engage them and the way you set up your work processes and everything. Mm -hmm. So people talk about that um, you know, a lot as well. And if you do it wrong, and if you go in a very simplistic view of Japanese culture, you can end up just like um, Steve, Steve Cox is, is his name at the, the ad agency, you know, the people who preceded him, they didn't get that. They didn't get that there was this mismatch there and, and they caused a big problem for themselves. And he, he spent his first two years in the company, you know, sorting that out. So there are nuances to it, you know, and, it, and you only get that through living it and through, you know, trial and error and, and talking to other people and reading like them. <laughs> oh, Frank, that's fantastic. Oh, what do you see? What are your hopes for this book? You've already mentioned one. Make sure that everyone outside of Japan gets a copy. Yeah. And all yeah. of the regional managers here get yeah. one to send it back. Yeah. To the yeah. Well, the first thing I think is to just get this recognition for the amazing people that are here in Japan. And, and uh, my advice to any company coming into Japan um, is to look at that resource first. Um, get in touch with people, you know, watch podcasts like yours, read my book, and there are other podcasts and, and uh, clubhouse rooms and there are all sorts of resources. But yeah, just tap into the expertise that's here on the ground is, is, is what I'd like people to, to understand. Frank, thank you so much. I mean, this is fantastic. All of you, make sure you get a copy. Frank, thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's Thanks, Lance. Right. Remember, press like and subscribe. Never forget, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. <laughs>